All right, so how many of you uh, worry? Come on, put your hands up. <clears throat> uh, worry is being unduly anxious or concerned about matters over which we have little or no control. So let's begin this with a little test. Answer to yourself, yes or no. Did you worry about anything this week? Can you name one thing you worried about this week? Yes or no? Would you say you have a problem with habitual worry? You worry a lot. Yes or no? Would other people say you tend to worry a lot? That's probably the real test. If you answered yes to any of these questions, this message is for you. Whether you believe in Jesus Christ or do not, you can be plagued by worry. You can worry about catching a cold, getting cancer, losing your job, paying your bills, a downturn in the stock market, getting a good grade, paying or receiving an alimony check, a custody battle, stress with in-laws or family members coming up at Thanksgiving or Christmas, or many other things. If you're a parent, you can worry about your kids. Parents set their young, sent their young son on his first camp experience. And he wrote, Dear Mom, you told me that something terrible would happen to me if I went to camp. Well, it did. Sincerely, Tom. <laughs> that did not help her. People do different things when they're worried. Some bite their nails. Some eat. I read of a stress diet. Breakfast. One half grapefruit. Dry piece of toast. Small glass of skim milk. Lunch. Steamed zucchini. One half piece broiled chicken. Two carrot sticks. One Oreo cookie. Mid-afternoon snack. Rest of the package of Oreo cookies. <laughs> Dinner. Two loaves of garlic bread. Two large pepperoni pizzas. Three Milky Ways. An entire frozen cheesecake eaten directly from the freezer. <laughs> we pay a heavy price for worry. Doctors know the, the toll that stress is playing in our country's health. According to the American Academy of Family Physicians, two-thirds of doctors' visits are spurred by stress-related symptoms. Tens of millions of Americans take anti-anxiety medicines. Dr. Elizabeth Whalen of the Harvard School of uh, Medicine suggests that stress and emotional distress can cause a change in the hormones circulating from the body which make it difficult to fight off cancer. British physician Sir James Paget writes, the cases are frequent in which deep anxiety is quickly followed by the growth or increase of cancer. So we worry about getting cancer and our very worry increases our chances of getting it. So how can we conquer worry? Jesus tells us, don't worry. Now this is our series, Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. He says, don't worry. Oh, thanks, I worry a lot. Remember Bobby McFerrin's song, Don't Worry, Be Happy? Play that, Brian, just so, uh, that's Cody. All right, let's hear it. <clears throat> Be happy, don't worry, be happy now. Remember that? That's what Jesus basically says. Don't worry. Parents, teach your children what Jesus teaches about worry. Studies show that teenagers today have more stress than at any point in history. Jesus tells us three practical reasons we are not to worry. First, it is incompatible with faith in God. So our text today is Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Would you stand with me and let's read this together. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life.
Jesus, you tell us not to worry, and yet we do. So tell us how we're supposed to do this um, so we can grow in this area and trust you more and worry less, maybe worry not at all. Speak to us. We, we do need your advice. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. Jesus tells us, look at the living things in creation. You see any worry out there? His argument is from the lesser to the greater. If God takes care of the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, won't he take care of you, his children? The Bible has a lofty doctrine of humanity. We are made in God's image to rule over creation. If we have that special of a position, will not God take care of us? Worry about the necessities of life is incompatible with faith in God. Jesus tells us, don't worry. To not worry does not mean that we just sit back, we don't do anything, we don't work. Uh, Apostle Paul writes, the man who doesn't work should not eat. God expects us to work. Birds, they make nests, they gather food, they lay eggs, they feed their young. It looks like God provides for them by giving them the resources so they can feed themselves. Jesus assures us that God is a loving father. Worry is incompatible with faith in him. Worry is a matter of not thinking rightly about God. So what's the solution to worry? Think about God. If worry is incompatible with belief in God, then we need to increase our knowledge of him. This is why I encourage you to all to have chair time. Get in your favorite chair and read the Bible daily if you can. Maybe you use our journal, answer a couple questions, or some other journal. Um, remind yourself of God's love and power. Two practices help me think right and the right way about God. One is to pray specifically. The Apostle Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Instead of worrying, we are to pray. Every time you worry, turn your prayer, your worry into a prayer. A prayer and worry don't mix. They're like oil and water. You say, I do pray, but I still worry. It doesn't help. Well, it's not just any kind of prayer Paul tells us to offer. Uh, the Greek word he uses, petition, means very specific requests. So if you want to be beat worry, offer specific requests. Last week I had a day that began with me worried. And so in my chair time, I told God what I was worried about. And I asked him to help me. And then I began my day in a much better frame of mind. Why does offering a specific request help you beat worry. Well, God answers prayers that bring him honor. One of the things I told him that I was worried about that day is that my email wasn't working. It just stopped working uh, the day before, and uh, I asked Christine, my assistant, to give me, to email me some stuff, preparation stuff for writing the message I was working on, and I was pretty sure I wasn't going to be able to open it. I said, God, I'm going to need that. Pray I can get that and I don't have to like go to Geek Squad and, you know, and I don't have time for that. It'd probably take a couple hours. Which led to my next worry that I wouldn't get my message written. And I had to get it done that day because the next day I had to do a board preparation. We are having a board retreat that weekend. So I prayed about it. I got to the end of the day. The sermon was done. I hadn't had to go out to get help. And it was very obvious that God had answered my prayer. You see, another thing that helped me when I prayed specifically was that I knew that God would either answer my prayer or he would give me something better because God always gives good gifts. 
So in either case, I no longer had to worry about it. So if you want to break free from worry, don't offer general prayers like, Lord, help me have a good day. Or bless all the children in the world. And how are you going to know if God answers that prayer? Be specific. What you're worried about, what you would like to see happen, and ask God to help. Now another way we can think right, in the right way about God is to praise God in all situations. We don't ignore the things that concern us, but we declare the presence of God. Praise and worry can't occupy the same space. The Apostle Paul says when we offer specific requests, we're to do it with thanksgiving. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving. In the verse just prior, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. The way to get rid of wrong thoughts like worry is to do right thoughts like praise. The right thoughts chase out the bad thoughts. Nothing does this better than praise. In praise, we focus on God's love and power so we realize we don't need to worry anymore. Remember when you were a little kid and you went to the store with your mom? You were just getting old enough that she didn't have to hold your hand all the time. And so you were in the store and you went off a few feet. That was okay. Then you went a few further feet further away. That was still good. And then you went further yet. You're having a great time. You're in the shoe department all by yourself checking it out. You felt so big. You were four years old and you could go off by yourself. It was so cool. Then you looked and you couldn't see your mom. Mom! No answer. So you yelled louder, Mom! No answer. You looked this way, you looked that way, you looked up, you looked down. So you ran down one aisle looking for her, didn't find her. Came back another aisle, couldn't find her. You're getting ready to have a full-scale meltdown. Where could she be? You looked under to see if maybe you could see her feet under one of the racks. Then you just laid down on the ground and you, did, you went full-scale berserk. And then you heard it. You heard her voice. Over here, baby. She knew where you were. She was watching you. She was just waiting for you to refocus on her. To know that she loved you. She was looking out for you. And that's the same thing God offers us. He says, hey, I love you. And I have all the power in the world. I just need you to focus on me. Believe in me that I'm there, that I love you and I have the power and give me praise. And you don't need to worry. Praise is a foundational principle in the Bible. In the face of praise to God who loves us, worry melts, melts like ice in the hot sun. Or it should. How much time do you spend praising God each day? Do you begin your prayers with praise? Or do you just jump into a litany of requests? There's a second reason Jesus tells us don't worry. It's incompatible with common sense. Jesus says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? By worrying, we can't add any minutes to our life. So in other words, it's useless mental activity. Jesus goes on to say, this is his final verse on the subject, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We're not to worry about something that's going to happen tomorrow. Tomorrow will have sufficient problems. Do not add tomorrow's quota on today. Tomorrow, or worry, is today's mouse eating tomorrow's cheese. Worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrows. It only adds, takes away our strength for today. So it doesn't make any sense. I mean, why have today be crippled by tomorrow's anxiety? Life is to be lived one day at a time. 
I mean, think about it, how silly it is. If you worry about something and it doesn't happen, you've worried once for nothing. If you worry about something and it does happen, you've worried twice for one thing. So it doesn't make any sense. The Frenchman Montaigne wrote, My life has been filled with terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. Dr. Walter Cavert reported a survey indicated 92% of the things we worry about never happen. So it makes no sense. So what's the solution? Jesus says, refuse to worry. He begins his teaching on, in this passage with don't worry. And then he ends it with don't worry. He says it three times. His solution is simply don't do it. Apostle Paul says the same thing in Philippians. Don't worry about anything. The second step to overcoming worry is to refuse to worry. You say, I don't have to worry, and I'm not going to do it. So the next time something causes you to worry, remember, you have a choice who runs the ranch. Picture our minds as trees and our thoughts as birds. Many birds will fly over our tree, our mind, but we don't have to let them make a nest in our tree. Worry is incompatible with faith in God. It's incompatible with common sense. And third, Jesus says it's incompatible with Christian witness. Jesus says, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. We're not to worry, for to do so makes us just like everybody else in the world, people that don't believe in God. We're different. Throughout this series, we've, in this series, uh, Things I Wish Jesus Never Said, we found that Christian witness is dependent on us being different. In order to be salt, we have to be pure. In order to change our culture, we have to turn the other cheek. So, Ask yourself, if I worry, am I any different than anybody else in the world in facing this kind of a concern? So what's the solution? The solution, Jesus says, is seek first God's kingdom. This is Jesus' final remark about worry. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So what does it mean to seek God's kingdom? Well, the Greek word is in the present imperative. In other words, we're supposed to do it day after day, continually. You seek what will be his will in the world. You seek to spread his kingdom, uh, to, to see other people come to know Jesus. If, we put all, if you put all your attention on spreading his kingdom helping other people come to know Jesus, then he promises all these things will be yours as well. As God sees your focus is on spreading his kingdom and doing his will, uh, and making this world a better place and seeing more people come to know Christ, he promises to give you everything you need to serve him. And since he promises to meet all your needs, you don't need to worry about them anymore. Never again do you need to worry about housing, transportation, food, clothes. A beggar in India sat by the side of the road. He heard that a Raja was coming through his area. So he got up early before the sun rose and he sat by the side of the road with his little tin cup hoping to receive something. He waited and finally saw dust in the distance, and then he saw the elephants coming, and when he got closer, they could see the, the fine garments hanging down the sides of the elephants, and then he saw the Raja riding on top of one of the elephants. When the Raja got to him, he stopped, and he said, what gift can you give me? This guy thought, what? I don't have anything. But he searched in his... Uh, stuff and he found a little pouch of rice 
And he carefully counted out three kernels of rice and gave it to him. And the Raja got back on his elephant and took off. He said, wait a minute. You took my food. I don't have anything. You didn't give me anything. Then he looked in his little pouch and in place of the three kernels of rice were three golden kernels. And then his cry could be heard throughout the land. If I'd only known, I would have given him everything. So it is with Christ. If we only knew that by sinking him first, his kingdom first, he would give us everything we need, we would give him everything. We'd give him our lives. If we only knew that when we seek him first, he would meet all our needs, we would put his kingdom first, his priorities first. Parents, Joy and I have had kids. We have kids. We know all about worrying about kids. Taking care of a household. But if you put God's kingdom first and seeing your kids come to know Christ and, and other people come to know Christ and that's your top priority, he promises to meet all your needs. Teenagers, God knows that you need friends, that you want good grades, you want to make the team or the play or whatever it is. You put your focus on serving him first and putting him first in your life and helping your friends learn about him. And he promises he'll meet all those other needs. Singles. I don't know, maybe some of you are hoping that, you know, somebody wonderful will come into your life. But you're, you're thinking, I don't know if anybody's ever coming. God knows your need for love and companionship. You put your focus on spreading his kingdom and in becoming the person God wants you to be. And he can bring that person into your life. He'll meet your needs. Grandparents, maybe you're worried about your grandkids, what's going on in their lives, where they're headed. Maybe you're worried about having enough money. God knows your needs. You put your priority on serving him first and spreading his kingdom, helping your grandkids come to know him in any way you can. And he'll honor that. And promises to meet all your needs. Three times in this text, Jesus says, don't worry. By the third time, we're expected to get it. He tells us not to worry because it's incompatible with faith in God. Because it's incompatible with common sense. And because it's incompatible with Christian witness. So don't worry. Be happy. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you tell us not to worry, but we do. We worry about all kinds of things, but you tell us that that's just not a good way to live. So we hear you. Would you help us with that this week? Kind of turn over a new mindset and refuse to worry? Instead, think more about you? And realize that if we worry, we're not different from anybody else. I want to give you a moment to, to pray to God. Maybe tell him something you're worried about right now. Maybe it's going to happen today or this week. Tell him what specifically what you hope would happen. You pray. Thank you, God, that you love us and that you're all-powerful. 
You see us. You care about everything going on in our lives. So help us today, this week, not to worry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.